välkommen till att uh, fokuswebinaret med forskningsledare Marion och Farrell från Sintef Digital. Sen så är er ju då som vi alla har sett uh, blivit mer och mer aktuellt i tiden nu när man alla ska digitalisera så är er ju sensorer hjärta i digitalisering. Och centralt både när vi snackar om avancerad processkontroll så väl som maskinlärning och eh, kunstig intelligens och autonomi och det hela, hvis inte datan är er gode så så faller allt som är sammant. Så så det jag gläder mig väldigt åt att höra på dig Marion och som jag nämnde för det att det är er väl så intressant då också för oss internt i Sintef för att lära miljöer runt dig och känna. Jag så för ingressen att det är er över 100 forskare som jobbar direkt med smarta sensorer och mikrosystem i olika fall från subsite yttre rum. Så här gläder mig att lära något nytt och så hoppas vi får många goda frågor till dig om cirka tre kvarter från nu så. Jätte välkommen Marion och då ger jag ordet till dig. Varsågod. Väldigt bra. Tusen tack. Um, I just I'm going to take this in English and hope that you can see the screen now. Yes. And the pointer as well is there. Okay. Very good. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, this was a, this was actually a nice presentation to make. Sometimes it's good when you're working all the time, something very close to something, to be asked to put together a presentation to present the bigger picture, uh, because it forces you to take a step back yourself and look at uh, all the things that we are doing and try and put it together in a way that tells a bit of a story to people. Um, so it was actually quite a nice job to uh, put this presentation together. Um, as Fruda said, I work as a research manager in uh, the department, which is called Smart Sensors and Microsystems, which has eight research groups. But we also have sensor people in Sintef Digital working up in Trondheim, one other group. So combined, we have quite a quite a good number of researchers working in this field. Um, we are uh, Sintef, just very briefly, because I'm sure many of you know who Sintef is. Uh, but just these are some numbers from the 2020 year report for the whole of Sintef, or Sintef AS. And the, we have around 2,000 employees, so it's quite a lot. The funny, the funny numbers here is that for 2,000 employees, we have 6,800 projects going. Uh, this is a 2020 and 3,600 clients. So we have a lot of projects going at the same time. Everyone is working on several projects at the same time. And uh, we have many clients. And because our goal is technology for a better society, our clients vary from uh, like one self-employed person type companies or startup companies all the way to the big ones like Elkem and Hydro in the process industry. So we do try and make ourselves available to all types of companies and all sizes of companies. So that's why we have so many. Um, when it comes to sensor competence at Sintef, uh, as Fruda mentioned, we have 100 researchers working directly with sensor technology. Um, and now this is directly like building sensors, designing sensors um, and uh, applied sensor research. And then we have other digitalization building blocks covered in other groups and research de departments within Sintef Digital. But pure sensors, we have around 100 researchers. Um, so on the left, you can think these are the types of sensors we mostly work with, uh, optical, acoustics, analog sensors, the, the kind of measurement principle behind the sensors. And uh, the next box says MEMS design and fabrication. And that is because we, we have the unique we are in the unique position that we have access to um, a micro and nano fabrication lab in, in Oslo here, unfortunately, it's by an M, where we can develop completely new technology, new components based on um, silicon and insulator fabrication. So silicon wafers. Uh, a lot of this would be MEMS design. So it would be um, MEMS with uh, electrical, uh, MEMS is a microelectrical mechanical system. So PZT type sensors, accelerometer, uh, pressure sensors, and also optical sensors and optical components uh, we are also working with developing at a micro and nanoscale. So this, what this allows you to do is take often very expensive sensors that have existed for many years and develop methods to reduce them in size, to make them mass producible because using them on the silicon on, on insulation fabrication uh, method allows you the possibility to 
upscale very quickly in your production numbers. So the, the reason for this lab is in the direction of mass production or large number production, lower cost, smaller in size. Um, and then, of course, the next step. So if you think that's at the component level, um, anyone working with sensors, because sensors is a broad term here, you have the component level of a sensor, the next level up is the actual instrument. So if you in, uh, incorporate components, put them together, uh, build the electronics around it, package it so that it's suitable for the environment it's going to work in, add the software, the interface, then you're up at the instrumentation level. And this is an essential part of the, the story of a sensor. You have to go from this enabling component up to an instrumentation level so that you can generate data, that you can take it out and do something with it. It's not a dead component, it becomes an active component. Um, but then uh, to become a solution, so if you go from component to instrumentation, so that it becomes an actual solution, and when I say solution, I mean now you're taking data and turning it into information so that the end user or the or whatever you want to use it for, you're providing information on that. It's no longer just ones and zeros. It is telling you something as a user of a sensor, what it is you need to know. So that that means you have to come up at this kind of sensor analytics, edge computing type, analyze the data, the raw data, give it enough, find enough instrumentation. It can also be about compressing the data because you have lots of data from image sensors, for example, at the edge that you might want to push out onto a system. You can't keep, um, pouring real-time uh, video data into a data system in a process uh, plant, for example. So compressing the data, making it more um, easily handled is an, an also important part of a sensor solution. So that is, the, there are the different components of sensor, developing a sensor, and the starting with the measurement principle, the component, the instrument, and all the way up to a solution that is relevant for, um, for industry. Now, I won't go into the into the details of all the sensor competence. This slide I've just put in there as a reference slide in case people want to go back and look at it afterwards. But it gives you an idea of the breadth of sensor technology we are working in. I'm leading the Applied Optics Group, um, but we have several research leaders, and each of these groups has approximately 10 to 15 people in it. So there is, there is um, capacity and there is people, there are many people behind these these phrases. It's not just we can do this. We have experts in these areas that um, that have spent time to dig into the depth of this competence. Um, so it's quite a, it, and that's a very important part of our offering is that we have many people who are going in into the depth in these areas and actually being able to develop new sensors then based on that. Um, if you think of Applied sensors. So at the at Minilab, we have the luxury of conducting kind of basic research and developing in, in new brand new technology. But a big part of our work is a customer coming to us and saying, we want to measure, we want this information. They don't care which sensor we use, they don't care um, well, they care about the price, but they don't necessarily care about what the what the technology is, what technology is best. Um, so our job is to uh, build good projects that use the domain knowledge usually at found at the customer because they know what they want to measure, but also getting research knowledge in the domain. So, so for example, um, you know, you have to have knowledge on the process or the if it's a food or farming that you have that knowledge and also the data analytics to, to bring it up to the sensor solution and not just be a sensor and the hardware. So these are the three elements that we try to have in all our projects. And they can't just stand alone from each other. They have to be integrated. So our projects, we try and make our projects sit in the overlap of these three spaces, the analytics, the domain competence and the hardware. And underneath that, then we're supported by infrastructure, labs that we can build sensors, uh, test sensors in a good way that we can push the limits of a sensor. Uh, I've shown three heads there from Syntef Industry. So I'm now talking about the sensor people in Syntef Digital. I'm not even talking about Syntef Digital fully, which is uh, broader again. But we, when we need domain competence, now we're talking about the process industry. So we would use people like Ulla Schu, Sven Grodal, Tur Orhag in Syntec industry. These are very good example of people who have come closer to sensors. So they are domain people who have learned more about sensors and measurement technology and meet us halfway. So this kind of synergy between people who 
we also need the like people who are working purely on the domain, but it's nice to have people who are pushing. So sensor people that are building uh, process competence and process people that are building sensor competence and those people meeting in the middle, these overlaps, um, I believe, is how digitalization is going to happen, actually, that we have people who are pushing towards the other competence that they need to to uh, to match a little bit so that they can begin to talk technically enough and, and dig deep into the details together. So these are very good examples of those types of people in Cintiff industry working in the process side. Um, and so the, the next thing is digitalization as a delivery. Um, we have we are working on the sensor part of this. And then, as you could say, in the last four, five years, uh, five or six years, the word digitalization has become the big trend. DigiPro is, is part of, uh, of that as well. And then you have to think, OK, sensors can stand alone. Even the analytics, um, bringing it to a solution is not enough. People and customers are asking for more and more uh, digitalization as a delivery and our position in that value chain with all these digitalization building blocks is um, is also something that we have developed over the last few years and it has happened through projects we have had projects that have asked for this uh, in the process industry many we have had many of these like sam and um several cognitwin in the eu where they have asked us to deliver at a higher level and that's a bit <laughs> that can be a bit challenging so that requires suddenly that sintef now you can't have a, a sensor project or an AI project. Now it is required that we work together better and coordinate ourselves to deliver this um, this solution at a higher level, a digitalization solution, not just a measurement solution. So we have begun to find our position in this in this um, delivery, this kind of delivery that the customer is looking, and it is something that we have had to, you know, move a little bit around in and figure out. We've learned it in projects. We have internal strategy projects about how to do this better. And we are getting better. And these are the four key four elements, I would say, for the process industry, where we're trying to look at sensors, big data, AI, linking those together, and then bringing them down to this control of the process and, and that com competence that we have always had, but learning these people learning each other's languages and working together has become a, an important journey for us too. So I'm just going to say a little bit about um, you know how where we start with our projects and it is often at the at the fundamental underlying physics. So when you have 100 experts working in sensors, they have a, quite a good fundamental understanding of something. They're not just skimming the surface and buying things off the shelf and putting it in, putting it in and hoping for the best. Now we do, we're big fans of using off the shelf technology when we, when we can, because there's no point in reinventing the wheel. But the prop, the point is having the knowledge to know when, when the off the shelf is correct and when it isn't. So we start with a fundamental uh, understanding of physics. So first principles. And we like to, uh, if we can simulate real world conditions, here's a COMSOL um, simulation of particle movement for a, an acoustic pressure field. So if we can get an understanding at a simulation level, but what we really need to do is get out in the field as quickly as possible. So prototype development, smart or uh, rapid prototyping, rapid enough prototyping so that we can come out of the lab. You get your control measurements in the lab, you get a good feel for something, you've done your simulations, but you need to bring it out into the field in some way. And the field might not be a very friendly place and it isn't in the process industry. So, and this is an example here of underwater, which is also not uh, very friendly. So trying to get flash LiDAR working underwater, building, housing that it can tolerate pressure, we're reducing the size and each iteration, reducing the power consumption. And here you can see uh, measurements underwater in a fish farm, uh, red tuna fish farm in Spain. The point is that we try and get out of the lab as quickly as possible and then reiterate. Like you, you do have to do prototype zero or one if you can afford it. Big projects allow you to do that, but they don't always allow you to do that. So sometimes there is only one prototype within the project. Um, but the, the goal is to get out and get the good data that tells you if this is working or not. So making good data for good research is an important part. And then you, re you need quite a finished prototype so that you can log data and create good data sets so that you can understand if this is working or not. 
Um, and it's also important for us to cross collaborate with other digitalization fields like robotics, mechanics um, are also impossible in chemistry. So we have to bring in this other competence as well to build towards this solution that we're aiming for. Let's check the time. So I'm going to go through some uh, different types of sensors that we have been developing, and some of them are very relevant for the process industry and others maybe are just there to kind of inspire, maybe it makes you think of something that can be um, interesting or uh, trigger a thought that could be interesting to follow up. Um, so robust image sensing and the word robust here is quite important. Um, I spoke about using off the shelf components when it's suitable, but it isn't always suitable. Uh, but we have very good examples of projects where we use off the shelves and we add uh, technology and adapt it. So this uh, on the top left is thermal imaging of the tapping process. And this has come through several projects. So Sam and Cogni Twin, we have honed this. We worked with Aramet in one project with Elchem kind of part of it. And in the other project in Cogni Twin, Elchem has taken a, a front seat and used the same kind of technology for uh, thermal imaging uh, using um, a standard cam a camera well it's a high-end camera but then the packaging of the you know housing dealing with dust all the things around the sensor putting it in there in there in the in the system or uh, uh, over the process looking at the data figuring out what's working understanding why it's not working going back and adapting all that the dialogue with the different technology suppliers and how to handle the harsh environment. Sintif has worked very closely with the um, with the end user to make sure that the images that you create are robust enough. Because if you're creating lots of bad images, then you can't go forward with this information that the end user inevitably wants at the end of the day. But then, and then this flash lighter is that I already spoke about in the previous slide. Here. There, there's always a story. There's always a, a project after project. So this project began underwater developing flash lighter. So instead of scanning lighter, which you've heard of with your cars, which is a point, you're, you're scanning a point all the time and you have to build up the image. This is a system that takes a full image. You have 3D information in that and then it takes the next image and it takes the full image. So you're, you always have a full 2D image of your 3D um, distances. Uh, and this was very handy for uh, underwater um, biomass estimation. That was the original plan. But now we're working with uh, ESA on getting this technology up into space. And because the same technology can now be used for uh, lo lunar landing. So the whole point is that you will put it on the, uh, on the spacecraft. And as it's landing on the moon, you want to, to map the surface of the moon as you're coming down so that you pick the correct spot. And then having a 2D a quick 2D imaging image of the system as it's coming down so that it's fast enough it is the goal. So the, there we're working very close with the chip designer to work on the timing and we come down to that level and we can come down to that level. We're working with the people developing the chips. We're working with ESA on the making its uh, space qualified. And it just shows the development of things that you can literally go from underwater to outer space with the same technology. And Zivid is an example of technology where we have developed it ourselves. There wasn't something in the market. We saw the gap and we developed um, a 3D camera for manufacturing. Um, and this is a spin out of, of Cintiff. Um, so say you have your robust images or you have um, you have technology that is good enough to create go uh, good images. Then there is the whole analysis of it. Um, but we don't we don't always know if the if the image that we were producing is good enough. So it's nice that we can pivot as well. So this example here in Immerso, the thought was we'll do 2D imaging. It's about uh, quality control during the building process. This is Veterinar High School in Oslo being built and they wanted to track that the the pipe the piping uh, um, and the the chasing for the wires was in the correct position all through the building process. So a kind of a monitoring system, and the, the idea was to use two D imaging. But because we've built tech competence in three D imaging as much as two D imaging, we've quickly realised you know we're not going to stick down or bog down with this two D image. It's not working. We could pivot and work on the three D imaging, and we have the competence then to to use that and do the analysis on that type of imaging instead of 2D imaging as well. Um, and, and it's about um, 
picking the you know, so you have the right system but then you have to analyze it and it could be in this case spin chip is about microscopy so getting a, measuring very small features uh, because here you're looking at blood samples who have nanoparticles that fluoresce and then you're looking at tiny fluorescent signals using a microscopic imaging system and then the an image analysis required for low light conditions measuring small features different optics then we are we're helping developing those kind of systems. So it can be big and it can be small, uh, depending on the needs. Um, we also work with robot vision. Uh, our, our niche here, I would say, is uh, where you don't have GPS data. So on the top left here, it's monitoring the inside of tunnels. Uh, there you don't have good GPS data and it's sending in drones and kind of developing autonomous methods for inspecting the inside of drones, but you don't have a method for, you don't have GPS. So you have to find the, it has to find its way while it's collecting data. So it's the navigational size of the sensing. You can also have an Im a sensor on it for measuring something, but the robotic platform itself needs to find its way. So that's where robot vision comes in. Uh, it's the, the seeing of the, of the robot. Uh, in, St in the Stoutnet project, you had, you were, in, um, inspecting the power uh, systems but they were they're between two mountains so you didn't have gps systems there feed carrier is an example of a robotic a robot that actually moves around um a barn where you're feeding animals it moves out of the barn mixes the feed mixture and moves back in and Distribute it, distributes it out to the cows. The goal eventually is to actually optimize recipe per cow, like actually knowing these cows need this or th that and being able to mix this, know the quality, bring it and then distribute it evenly or correctly amongst the cattle. The reason they have gone, they have had systems that are suspended from roofs uh, to do this kind of just uh, giving the feed to the animals, but they wanted to go more internationally. And then you, if you go into countries like Spain or more southern countries, they don't have the building restrictions or the weight um, capacity that roofs in Norway have because of the snow. Uh, so you had to, they had to develop a system that could come off the roof and onto the ground, so that they could go outside the Norwegian market. Um, so the tracking of that. And here in Kongsberg Maritime, we're working on a hull cleaner. So anything with biological uh, growth on the front of the ship is increasing friction. If you increase friction, then you're wasting energy. And here they have, it looks like the room, it's like the Roomba robot that you use to, to uh, vacuum your floor at home. But this will actually, these will come out when the ship is in harbour and they will drive around the hull of the ship and scrape it. So they're working with Yutun on the paint design of this as well. Scrape it clean and then reduce the friction so that when it goes back out, it, um, but I mean, the images of this are pretty bad. It looks lovely there in that picture. But when you see the real images from the camera trying to find its way around, it is very, very um, scattering and hard to see the actual surface that you're trying to measure. Um, when it comes to machine learning, this is a big trend word. It is spoken about a lot um, and we have our own position within machine learning. So, and there are lots of people in Sintef working with machine learning and AI as well. Our role in, in machine learning and AI is the, the sensor near AI, um, AI and machine learning and signal analysis. What can we do for on base to our raw sensor data to get the maximum out of it to reduce the amount of it uh, so that it is usable further along the digitalization chain. So that's our position in machine learning. We also have a very important role in creating anodated data. So what I mean by that is you have a measurement, but you don't know what it means. We have to work on building measurements where we have the measurement and also a value that we know represents that measurement. So if it is a temperature, so if it is the temperature of the tapping process, we have to have the manual measurement of that tapping uh, process so that we can say this image, we believe the temperature is this. So building automatically building data sets and big enough data sets that you can go towards AI over long periods of time. Uh, with this annotated or reference data is the key to successful machine learning. There have been too many uh, examples where just taking up lots of measurements and then hoping the machine learning will sort it out. 
um, we are working on more a more systematic approach to that. But we are also looking at methods for um, using existing al algorithms. We don't need to develop new algorithms all the time or building or using existing data sets. So, for example, this agri robot, uh, our PhD student worked on using data sets of a drone that had gone through a forest and collected data. And this was a publicly available data set. So it was tracking the path of a forest. And she was hoping to be able to use the same data to indicate that she's in the middle of these uh, strawberry tunnels, because it's the same idea. It's a path in between kind of bushes. Uh, but there was a bias when she did the analysis. But looking at existing data sets is an option if, if there is good enough control, but we can't always do that. So we have to develop our own methods for automatically collecting good data. <clears throat> so applied spectroscopy is where you look at the, so you, you when you look at water in an image, it is, it's clear that it is water. But if you look at it from a, an applied spectroscopy, uh, eyes, what you're actually looking at is the bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen. So spectroscopy allows you to look at the chemistry of a, of, of a material, the chemical bonds of what's in the material instead of the visible that you see in an image, a normal image. So for water, it's the OH bonds. Um, in carbon dioxide, it's the CO2 bonds. So it's looking at the the building blocks of the molecules and the atoms build, making the material. And this is, we have used a lot in the food industry, looking at protein and fat, um, and also in the, on, uh, the online sorting industry. So Tumra, we have developed commercial products for sorting plastic online uh, using spectroscopy. So looking at the bonds of the different, chem, the different plastic types, you can sort the plastic. This isn't revolutionary. You could do this before. But what we have worked on is building something that's fast enough to go across a two meter wide belt with uh, two tons per hour of, of waste going through. So it's the speed at which it needs to be done for it to be useful is what we have worked on. And this has been a long term success. Now, Tumor sends maybe sells maybe 10,000 of these machines a year sorting waste at that speed. Um, and this uh, IF group and project here, we're looking at ice on the road. We're actually trying to predict road conditions, driving conditions, and so that you do correct amounts of salting. And this is a very good example of trying to, to build a good uh, data annotation or uh, annotated data set. So we had to actually build a post. This is installed up in Trondheim, and it has a small little uh, carriage on tracks and a, a patch of tar macadam. So through the winter season, this uh, carriage was going back and forth and it was uh, had, it's like a mini Breutabil. So it was pushing the snow away and then you were imaging both with spectroscopy and camera. And that little uh, um, carriage was measuring the friction at the same time. So that was our reference value, uh, the value telling us what the optical measurement was measuring. The optical one is the goal because it could be up on a, on a light uh, post along the road and measuring the driving conditions. But the, the physical measurement on the ground was our reference. And this went on over the win winter to build good data sets so that we could look at machine learning and AI methods. So this is a good example of how, uh, how we work on those kind of systematic data set building. Um, we have worked uh, many years on gas and air monitoring and very much with the process industry. We've had a couple of people here who have um, worked a lot with Sintif industry on build, taking FTIR systems, adapting, it's a, another type of spectroscopy, taking them out into the field. Um, and FTIR will allow you to measure lots of gases at the same time instead of just one gas. So it's a very good system for mapping what's actually happening in the process. What's happening? How are they changing over the time? Is this gas going up, this one going down? How do they relate to each other? We've done a lot of um, tests, field tests, where we bring these measurement systems close to the process and measure the gases coming off or in the flue gas uh, and uh, to build a better understanding, not necessarily to install that sensor there permanently, but to build a better understanding of the process itself. Um, but we are also looking at, uh, we have also looked at sensors that are installed permanently as well. And that's where Minilab has come in uh, very well because they can allow us to build simpler versions of this FTIR um, that are dedicated to one gas type or two gas types and actually uh, make it cheaper that you can install online. And I'll show some examples of startup companies at the end working with that. 
Um, structure health monitoring is also very relevant for the process industry. And here you're trying to cover a large area usually. So you're trying to have distributed sensing. You don't measure at one point, you're trying to measure over a large area along a large pipe um, or on many parts of a, a pipe or a tank or whatever it is. And um, there's a lot of work here on um, PZT sensors, so vibrational sensors. We have worked with off-the-shelf simple ones on the top here. This is an example of a simple, simple um, sensor, but we build the system around it for good logging of the data, good handling of the data, and, and interface to understand the data. Uh, and that that is coming, that is again going from a component to an instrument up to an actual solution. So we work at that level. The second box here is showing something that Cintiv is developing themselves. Uh, it has its own resonant frequency, which moves depending on the strain. And this is something we're working on further developing and commercializing because it's going to be much cheaper than an optical fiber type distributed sensor. They are quite expensive. At least the interrogator is very expensive and also much more accurate than um, and better resolution than a strain gauge. Uh, so we have the option to develop uh, those kind of sensors if needed. And this is a good example of, yes, you can find things off the shelf, but this can this can be cheaper or smaller or, or even better as well at the same time if we're really lucky. Um, and that brings us on to condition-based monitoring, which is a more, um, which is often accelerate, uh, accelerometer-based measurements. Um, here on the top left, we're looking at sensors installed on bogies. So this is the wheel axis. And here you've got moving parts. So the difficulty here is getting something that is generating robust data. So how you package the sensor in, the logging tools and how you get the data out so you, that you build these good data sets so you understand the sensor. Um, that was a very important part of that design. On the right, we're looking at scaling on pipes. So steam pipes in a kind of, it, this is a waste to energy plant, Sumitumu, and they have a lot of scaling as a problem on their tanks. And when that happens, it, it's very bad for the process and their energy use. And we had to, we were, we had to do a lot of simulations to understand how we could build something to, to, to detect, to early, to detect early enough if there was uh, the beginnings of this um, scaling. And it, it involved a mechanical design where we actually created the sound. So instead of uh, installing stuff along the pipes, we actually started banging the pipes to make a different sound. So the more the scaling, the different the sound and measuring that, but de designing the geometry of this uh, shaker and then the detector and how they were relative to each other and picking out the frequencies that had to be simulated and tested. And then, um, and then the, the the then you had to build the the electronics and everything around that to measure it. So that's something we're going forward with, and and have sent an EU project in on this as well. Um, also, with condition based monitoring, it can be humidity based sensing, and that's a quite a demanding environment for a sensor. Uh, how can you measure? So you need to measure. Uh, so this is a corrosion under insulation. In in insulation, you can have little bits of water residue. You shouldn't have oxygen to cause corrosion, but if you have water, you can have bacterial growth, which create oxygen and that can create corrosion. Uh, getting the sensor inside there without damaging the sensor itself and not actually because the humidity is bad for a sensor, the packaging around that was really important and the logging and also the distribution. So you have to have them along several places and building something that you can repeat and install on several places to cover that area is very important as well. Um, and just to, that relates to packaging. Um, when you want to do this instrumentation in a harsh environment, uh, it can be high temperature, high shock, high vibrations, high pressure. Then, then the knowledge to how to package that in, testing it. We have test chambers that, that increase and in cycle pressure and temperature and vibrations to also understand if it's working or not. And this is an expertise we have, which is very relevant for the process industry. The top example is actually a world record. We actually managed to get the electronics to, to work up to 540 degrees. Now we didn't actually get there. That's kind of, uh, <laughs> we did, they didn't actually work at 540 degrees, but the probe had this um, um, multi-layer insulation with liquid nitrogen. The electronics could work up to 200 degrees, but with this system of pumping liquid nitrogen around the front of the, around the important electronics of the probe, 
you buy time. So you could put the probe down the well. This was a geothermal well that you were measuring the 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 conditions down there. Um, if you can buy time that you can do a, 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 a logging measurement over time, then then it's it's a it's a successful measurement because we were trying to measure in an environment which is 540 degrees. The electronics worked at 200 degrees, but the packaging allowed it to last longer. And then the sensor could work and all the sensitive electronics could um, be contained in this multi-layer insulation packaging with the liquid nitrogen. Um, and we can also go down to miniature packaging. So this goes down an actual uh, oil well. I think Norse was also involved in this project. Uh, and it's a logging tool, meaning that it doesn't send information back up all the time. There are capsules that are sent down into the well. And then they're, when the oil is coming back up, it brings them back up with them. And then you can take them out and see what information was logged while the sensor was down in the, in the hole. Um, uh, it's basically the temperature, pressure, the conditions down there uh, and bringing it back up to understand how it was uh, while it was down there. So that's a little bit about um, the packaging. I think um, that's nearly it. Oh yeah, the industrial acoustics was the last one. Uh, here we are, we have this group is up in Trondheim and they develop uh, ultrasound and acoustic sensors and also the signal processing, again, very important. It's also always important, this analysis of the sensor data. Uh, they have labs for understanding wave propagation. So here you can see they're looking in their lab with concrete um, and through pipes. So they have the facilities, the space, the equipment to understand how it should work in the lab. They have expertise in the modeling side to uh, know what to expect, uh, both in the control conditions and also as you introduce less control conditions. And then based on that knowledge, they can build uh, new transistor or transducers and design transducers. And they're also looking at non-destructive testing for manufacturing. So um, if they can develop methods for monitoring the, for robot manufacturing of the, the windmills, if you can do, a, have a system for understanding the, the quality of the windmills during manufacturing. So how we can automate this, there's a big push for how we can simplify the manufacturing um, of these wind farms so that they're easier to install and quicker to install. Uh, so they work a lot on that. And they've also worked with uh, health health um, applications, looking at the sounds, people, like your body makes sounds de depending on the condition. And these, these are sensors for monitoring um, how the body is sounding. Does it sound healthy? Not does it feel healthy, but does it sound healthy? And can that tell us something about someone's health? Um, yeah, so that was it. And just, oh, finally, just a little bit on the startup companies. Uh, so our, our favoured model, I would say, is that we find a technology provider that can take something to market. So we develop something. We have a technology provider who's interested in the commercialization. We bring it to, say, maybe the first, second or third prototype, and they take over at that point and we support them. But sometimes that's not how it works. Uh, sometimes there isn't a technology provider. Sometimes it's quite new what we've developed and nobody is uh, willing or interested in taking it on. And then, or we want to develop our own company or build our own company. So we have several examples, and this happens a lot from the technology developed in Minila because it can often be groundbreaking or newly enabling uh, that we can build companies. So uh, I would say the sensor and hardware people working in Cintiff have been some of the most active in the startup um, uh, ecosystem. And we have had many, many successful startups over the past 10, 15 years, which are doing very well and working in different fields and gas measurements, uh, microphones, uh, ear, pieces so so also in consumer and um and medical and uh, two medical here and gas and tunable is also working in the process industry for gas monitoring so we we have that option if there isn't a technology provider it's a little bit more complicated journey and it's a slower journey but it is an option that we uh, take advantage of if we need to so that's just the final um thing but we do like to have a technology provider from the start if we can yep then we have five minutes through that. <laughs> I hope that's okay. <laughs> You're muted. You're yes. Mu oh, yeah, tusen, tusen takk. Kjempespennende. Fantastisk moro å høre om og se. 
Då kan jag vara sån ostyr här visst det er en del kommentarer eller frågor. Ja, men vi kan ta den på norska också på på frågor. Ja. Visst är er nu. Jag ser det nu händer. Ja, det var väldigt lärorikt. Jag syns det själv jag jobbar i Sinte för var mycket nytt för mig här. Så det var bra. Där kom Christian upp med honen. Ja. Hej Christian. Ja. Hallå. Eh, yes, det var eh, morsomt å høre på. Jeg eh, har et spørsmål til eh, den sliden du hadde om sånn distribuert eh, vibrasjonsmåling. Eh, der hadde du en Lego-klass med en liten, eh, liten yeah. chip på. Mm-hmm. Og, så, og så sammenlignet du litt med distribuert vibrasjonsmåling. Eh, jeg har jobbet litt med det, eh, så det er derfor jeg spør. Og så sa du at uh, dette er mye bedre, billigere enn, uh, enn å bruke fiber, for eksempel. Uh, ja, kan det kan være det. Ja, kan være det. Men uh, altså, hvis vi snakker om 100 kilometer og 150 kilometer og sånn, er det fortsatt billigere å få en måling hver tiende meter med en sånn teknologi som dette her. Så yeah. lurte jeg på hvordan, hvordan uh, transporterer du informasjonen i et sånt system som dette her. Uh, er det, du må jo være ledningen her, da. Må du ikke um, ja, det, det skal det være, men det kan, vi har utviklet sensorer også som med, med wireless communication, og det har vi jobbet veldig mye med i Minilab. Så den, um, en av de biologiske sensorene, den in vivo bionics, det er, skal være wireless også. Så du, det, det er veldig lite energi og information, eller information du skal bare måle bitte lite endring i, I um, i frekvens, så det er mulig å tenke wireless uh, og, og ha dem litt sånn installert langt. Uh, ja. Og da er signal i optiske fiber, er optiske fibern selv veldig billig. Men den, den integrator som du må sende, du må sende ja, en puls ned, og så må du måle det tilbake, for det er det som er dyrt. Og ja, her er det en mindre kompleks signal å måle. Så det kan, uh, kan være... Men dette er noe som... Vi har utvecklat internt lite och lite uh, i andra projekt och vi ska utveckla detta vidare. Men det är er stort ja. potential här med detta. Uh, Guido heter han som jobbar med det. Men jag kan se, om du vill ha lite mer information kan jag sätta dig i kontakt med riktig person. Här prövar jag att representera alla. <laughs> så det är inte så. Men han ja, han det, det er bara en er bara nyfiken för uh, det har varit intressant att se sett några sammanlänkningar för det ja. detta detta kan ju vara väldigt intressant för 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 industri mm. eh, områder, da. Yep. Eh, men då kan jag sätta dig i kontakt med Guido och få lite mer eh, info om det. Tack. Var det Ja. Då är er det framdeles öppet eh, här. Vill du ha några frågor till Marion? Nej. Nej. Då. Ja, de har på sig vet hvor du bor så de er bare ja, det är ju bara att Och här som jag ser det är er många forskare bak allt detta så det här ja, er visst är er något som är er intressant bara kontakt mig och så sätter jag i kontakt med riktig person. Det tar två minuter. Så det er... jag har ett uh, kort fråga till. Eh <laughs> uh, det går på uh, vi sitter ju på här ja. Uh, ja. Någon av oss uh, har har du någon översikt över vilka aktiviteter det har på här ja? för tiden eller har det någon projekt som går eh, mot sällskapet på här ja? ja vi har i samma projekt har vi jobbat med Eremet ned i Herøya den uh, termiska avbildningen är er installerat uh, där nere um, vi har projekt med Yara vi har haft i alla fall uh, och Equinor har vi också projekt med uh, de akustiska den akustiska gruppen har jobbat med dem där um, så ja, vi har, um, jeg har ikke oversikt nu, men vi har projekter med dem der nede. Du kan jo vet også, um, Frode. Uh, men vi er der op der nede og uh, af og til uh, med målekampagner og sådan noget. Mm. Mm. Ja, for jeg kunne tænke mig, at uh, det kunne være dårligt uh, om du eller andre i sensormiljøet i New Oslo kunne tage en tur til her. Oh, ja. Ja, ja, absolut. Det är er inget. Vi prövade att samla samman till ett uh, workshop eller eller workshop eller sånt här nere. Lunch seminar eller något sånt. Ja, det kan vi absolut göra. Ingen problem. Ja. Okej, okay, tack. Ja. Väldigt bra. Ja, där fick vi en gott initiativ upp också så det är er fint. 
Ja, men då tror jag vi rätt och slett bara runda av Marion så tusen tack igen. Var det hyggligt? Ja, okej. Okay. Har det gått